but I would like to maybe share a few ideas um, that I've jotted down about aspects of the discussion that we can get started with. And I, I really would encourage people to just chirp up and we, I really would like to hear your ideas. I'm sure everybody would like to hear um, what everyone has to say. We have an hour to talk about this stuff. Um, and then once we finish, it's now 4.30. Once we finish this discussion, it will be 5.30. And then we have until 7 before dinner. So you have, a cut, you have an hour and a half in which you can relax, you can go back to your room, you can, you can freshen up a little bit, and then we'll have dinner in the same room. Okay, so, and that should be nice because that'll be around the time of sunset. So we'll be able to kind of like eat and, and, and relax a little bit. I'll maybe have a few concluding remarks just to kind of finish off the meeting, but that will be the whole rest of the day. So you've got one more hour, hang in there. Okay, so um, I just wanted to kind of maybe kind of summarize some of the thinking that I've formulated in the last, uh, from this meeting so far and I'd very much like to get your feedback. Um, first of all, I'd like to kind of emphasize what it is I am looking for personally in this discussion. What I'm looking for is the characterization and the realization of the liquid network, of the environment in which we as a community can easily share information, we can share data, we can share code, we can, uh, essentially the vision, I, I think that the kind of moment that I, the, 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 the thing, the image that I have as being the desired outcome is this image of James on the plane putting together a, uh, um, a, a, a rapid fire, easy to use um, NLP system that just kind of like generated a bunch of results that he could share with us rel relatively straightforwardly. That's the kind of ease of use and ease of development that I think we need in this community to be able to just kind of like throw things together, get things to work, share the data and see how they go. Now, obviously that's a bit of a pipe dream. We have a long way to go before we can do that and maybe I'm being um, idealistic in that respect, but that's the goal for me, okay? So um, that being said, um, I think there are aspects to, this, to the development challenge that we have that are worth kind of talking about partitioning and thinking about in terms of how do we characterize the different pieces of the puzzle. Um, first of all, of course, we have the problem of data. The text itself, the supporting data, and actually not just the supporting data, but can we leverage existing knowledge from existing resources to help us understand, to help us interpret the data? Is the background knowledge that we need to use? So there's all this kind of information that's out there in various different forms that's, that's an aspect of the, of the problem space. Um, then we have the different aspects of the community of the end users who are actually engaging in this exercise in, in the pursuit of science and building informatic systems. You have the researchers who are the end users who need to find quick references that they can then use to think about new experiments and try and craft things. You have students Actually, a, a, um, Jim's talk uh, discussion about how we might be able to use students as curators, or you know, these guys all read the literature. They have to read the literature when they come into the subject for the first time. They have to try and make sense of it. Can we leverage their effort? Can we actually help them in doing that, and in so doing, help populate the systems? Um, there's NLP researchers, of course. There's a whole community of people who currently, I think, are a great untapped resource. There's, there's, there's people just down the street who are, who are you know, experts in, in, in natural language statistical and, and, and non-statistical natural language processing and linguistics. They know about these problems and they've thought about them deeply. They don't know the domain, but, they can, but if they had access to models that they can understand, then they might be able to use the, the, then they might be able to do this more frequently and more easily. And of course we have biocurators and we have systems builders. And I, I, I put them in different categories because I think that you know, um, there's a big difference between the people who are building systems to help biocurators and the biocurators themselves. Okay. Um, so that's data, community, You've got the third thing is code, uh, libraries and systems, the actual, you know, the tools themselves. The library, the actual implementation of the code, the design of the code, um, the, the, repo the code repositories where they live, um, the unit tests that people use to test them and such like. All of these things are another component. 
And then, um, and then finally, I would say the target knowledge representation. How do we conceptualize the problem that we're addressing? So triage, for example, is a different pro is is itself a problem that we that, ha that that a lot of people are dealing with, but we haven't really encapsulated. We haven't designed the optimal or studied the optimal process of what a triage step needs to look like, or at least we, ha we a lot of people have thought about it. Um, have we fin have we figured out uh, an operational model that could be used as a standard approach for that kind of thing, and is that a useful thing to do? Uh, how is that different from gene ontology curation? How is that different different from reactome curation and and the needs of, of you know, the different kind of approaches? And you know, one of the things that I think could be an interesting concrete proposal is to think about how we would partition the different um, elements of this knowledge representation as different tasks and in so doing be able to kind of craft specific metrics that are relevant for different tasks. This is um, one of Paul's suggestions that, that, that he um, chipped up with early on in the discussion. So, um, so that's a lot to think about. Please, any thoughts, any, any comebacks? Cecilia? So in terms of NLP groups, um, what I would suggest if, because by a creation community might not know about, I show a list of many, many different tools, right? But the bio creators probably are not aware of even a third of those. Um, so one suggestion is to, for NLPs who are interested in interacting with bio creation community, is for them to join the um, ISB list, mailing list, uh, because there are ones, I think, I don't know how frequent, maybe, one of you remember that they um, request for featuring uh, your resource. So if you have a tool that you think might be interested, you can, you can actually write about that and they will be distributed. So it will be in the news. So you, that is a way at least to reach out or you can send an email. I have this, is anyone interested to uh, look into this tool or something? I think it, that it would be the first, very, very first step, minimal step. I would add to that to say that, that um, even popularizing and showcasing the task of biocuration in the context of NLP is probably a really interesting and important step that we haven't taken. So um, actually, Ellen, could I ask you to comment on that? Just in terms of, you know, you're a newcomer to the field because, you know, you've talked to us about it. Um, how would we go about trying to um, talk to people in the NLP community and get them interested. And actually, Kevin, I think you're, 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 you should probably comment on this as well, if I could put you on the spot. Would that be? Um, yeah, so let me, let me say um, one slightly negative thing and then one um, positive thing. So uh, I can say there, there is a huge entry cost to getting in for someone who doesn't know this domain because the vocabulary is very dense and, and it's hard to get intuitions about the text because you don't understand what it means. And then it's not something you can just, you know, uh, read a few papers and really understand the domain. You have to make a commitment, I think, to understand this domain. So that's, I think that explains why um, there's a pretty strict subset of NLPers who tend to work on the biocreative stuff. On the other hand, I can tell you that NLP people go crazy for data and, and, and anything they can evaluate easily with evaluation scripts and numbers. And there are a lot of these um, sort of shared competitions that uh, happen among the general NLP community, like the Connell shared tasks and semivals and things like that. And that might be a way to bring a new task to the larger NLP community by creating, say, a, a biocuration or triage data set, something like that. Um, especially something at the document classification level where you don't have to go in and, and understand detailed annotations. It's just, hey, this document fits this bill and this other one doesn't, and you can create some more general guidelines for people to understand the basis for that. Um, so those are, those are things they're pretty open to. They're always looking for new kinds of tasks to, to advertise to the masses. And then you get students involved too. They love those things. Sometimes they're even used in classes and you can sort of grow a community bottom-up, potentially by 
<coughs> making a data set like that available for some sort of these broader competitions. That's one idea, anyway. So, um, Kevin, would you like to comment or? Sure. Right. Sorry, you'll be next. So Ellen completely hit the nail on the head. It's, it's all about data. Um, so uh, the world is full of people who do NLP, who take some kind of machine learning approach, and if you give them a labeled data set, they will come. They're just going to throw their algorithm at whatever is out there. Um, and uh, so there's th that aspect of engaging people, particularly through competitions. And um, the, one of the other things that draws people to this field is the availability of resources. Um, so knowing that you have a terminological resource like the genontology and knowing that you have access to 20 million abstracts through PubMed is, um, that are copyright free is a very attractive um, you know, situation for an NLP person. So the more we can advertise the presence of, of those kinds of things, the, um, the more we'll, we'll make the field look attractive to people. But you know, as, as Ellen said, it's all about the data. So it looks like it's still we need, still need a better coordination. So the the bio-curation community, we already so um, a few of, many of the mods were already participating in the bio-curative. Already made clear that we very we already have lots of curated data set, and they were willing to even work further to provide that, make that accessible. So even for the bio-curative, the the second task goal, what we are doing is to do a. I forgot it's XML, is do a marked up uh, Go annotation and also with the underlying sentences essentially to, to provide a very detailed curated data set. But it appears that some of the, the NLP community are still not aware of this valuable resource. So there's probably, we probably need a, a single platform, whether it's through the bio-creative or a new one, so everybody knows that this is a place if you're looking for data or if you're looking for, want to promote your own tools. So that's one comment. And uh, the second one, um, the second one is uh, from the bio-curator's perspective. So we are aware there are many different algorithms that are doing the same thing. For example, entity recognition. It becomes sometimes frustrating for us to test each one of those. And uh, in our, in the dream, so ideally, could the NLP community, you come up with a unified, see here's other systems we'd like you to test. Otherwise, it's really becoming, in the first we tried one, then we tried a second one, and uh, like uh, Kevin said, there are so many teams working on the NLP, and is there a better way to better coordinate this? Okay, I think Harold was, Harold was next, but yeah. Okay. Um, so this, this actually backs up a little bit, maybe all the way back to the end. When you were listing the different communities, and one community that I think wasn't singled out, but we should continue to think about, is the publishers themselves. Um, and and I'm, I'm sure Judy's heard all this before. It's like there's so much that could be done at the editorial level to make curator work easier and even maybe like free the NLP f from somewhat mundane tasks like one, does the paper, what organism is the paper talking about in its genes? And, and, and you know, I, I look at that as like, you know, well, if the editors would insist that people identify what they're using in some um, non-buried parts of papers, et cetera, things like that. So that's, that's just an example, but I think, you know, we should, we should um, can get the, uh, we, should, we should hope that, that uh, publishers would help us and get involved in making um, the information um, more accessible um, at least primarily to, to people in, in, interested in this group, NLPs. I mean, I know they're very protective. They don't want to hand out, you know, free papers and everything, anything like that. But on the other hand, we 
add value to their papers, the papers by using them for these particular um, tasks. That's a great point, and I would say that the, the incentives of, we would have to understand the incentives of the publishers and feature those into how we would address them uh, as part of the process, because they, they're running businesses, they have to pay people, and as do we, but, but the, perhaps the focus is different. So he says. So along those lines, um, so basically we are trying now to see what are the most, uh, for the different groups, what are the top uh, journals and what are the publishing houses and try to, for example, we are trying to um, have some conversation with Elsevier to see if they can open for Next BioCreative so we can, and they that, did that before uh, for BioCreative 2.5 to see at least uh, for the BioCreative uh, competition if we can have access to the journals that are more like, uh, representative for the curation task. Jim? No, Jim. Okay, that's very kind of you. Uh, so someone mentioned the words, you know, added value and my ears kind of pricked up um, because that's, you know, sort of the, the buzzword, you know, that all the publishers use to justify why they need to keep the, these documents behind a paywall and so on. Um, but now that I'm part of Elsevier, um, I'm starting to learn a little bit about kind of the other side of, of I'm not leading boycotts against them, I'm actually part of them now. Um, I, I'm learning to, starting to learn kind of from their perspective kind of what, um, what has held them back in the past and what things have worked and what things haven't worked. Um, and um, there's, I, can, I can say from what I've learned in just the, the past few months, that there's a, a lot of interest in figuring out um, ways that you know they can really add more meat to the we add value um, uh, statement, other than well you know we coordinate peer review and we copy edit. You know they want to say lots more things um, there. So depends on who you talk to, but for the most part, the I know a lot of people are really interested in um, in doing this. Um, Chris Schillam. Um, at Elsevier New York is working on a text mining um, a prototype that um, will essentially be a way for um, uh, for people to do text mining um, across the entire Elsevier corpus and get back you know fax things through this um, this nice framework that he has so if anybody wants to has an idea and they're like I want to talk to this guy and get him kind of on his pilot for doing the text mining come and see me and I can put you in touch with him. Um, and uh, on the Mendeley side of things, um, we're more than happy to help people out with any kind of um, uh, um, you know, text mining project. The way that we're kind of doing it right now as we're sorting out the details is you bring us the code and we'd be happy to run it on our cluster. Um, and uh, you know, we've probably got a good portion of Science Direct or Scopus or whatever um, uh, in there, you know, we can't give out the, all the PDFs, but we do have limited small groups that you can work in, and we also have it, um, uh, you know, everything on Hadoop, so you can give us the jar and you can go run the, the algorithms and kind of do the in-house study. So those are two options, I would say, from our side, and we're continuing to work on it. So I would like to comment on that, but just very briefly, sorry, Jim. Um, is like one of the things that I would definitely, so I'm very interested, and in, I'd like to get in touch with Chris about whatever he's doing, because it sounds as if he's doing the same kind of stuff that the Sinomine vision is all about. Um, but you guys are going to, but Elsevier is going to have to provide incentives for the researchers that go beyond, that actually is something that we, that, that, that forwards the vision of infrastructure builders, text miners, and bio-curators as well. So it's not just a question of the value add has to be mutual and it has to support the open access, open goals of, of what we're standing for in addition to, you know, providing extra value that allows Elsevier to justify why they are important. So, so I think there's a conversation to be had, but it has to be a mutual interaction. Okay, okay so I, want, I wanted to back up to the initial question to Alan and Kevin, which is like both of you guys emphasized the idea that if, you know, we say we have data, then the NLP people will come. But it's not clear to me that we have the data in the form you want. 
and it's particularly, you know, one of the things that's really useful in, in what Celia talked about in about creative is the blinded set, right? So even if there's, you know, millions of things that have already been annotated, that's not a very good test set if it's already out there. So, are, you know, do you guys feel like there's enough input from the NLP community in terms of designing, you know, how the competition should be set up in terms of the data needed from, you know, from day one or day zero? Which on the spot since you're nodding. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'll pass it on to them. I'm not, I'm not really sure except that, um, uh, yeah, it's not just a matter of the data but also a very clear understanding about how different um, uh, competitors are gonna be compared and evaluated in a fair way and be able to publish with their results. So yeah, there needs to be a very clear evaluation standard. And all this exists in biocreative, I mean, to a large extent, but it needs, I think, to attract new NLP people, it needs to get, there needs to be something like that outside of biocreative because most NLPers don't even dive in there at all. That's the first point I was trying to make earlier. I want to make two points. One is to go back to Gully's initial presentation, which is that from the context of those of us who do um, curation of the literature, it's efficiency that is the measure. So one of the things we've been doing with, because, um, you know, yes, there's, you know, the high standards and all of that, but at the end of the day, is, is it more efficient to have a curator work on the literature? Is it more efficient to, to employ these new tools? And with Gully's project, what we have done is um, uh, we can set aside papers that have yet to be curated. And then we do this, the parallel test of using his system and having the curator time their curation efforts. So that's one measure, one way of doing it. And then I, the other statement uh, that I wanted to respond to is this question of value added. And where, and I've been quite interactive with Elsevier uh, as well, and there's a couple of things uh, there. I think that I'm also very interactive with um, a group of people that um, run the small, um, like American Physiological Society, and they have their own journal, and therefore they don't want any open access because it's subscription to their small journal that that is so key. And I think it was Max or someone who was talking about the little journals, the ones that they're not getting into these big systems. So we have that kind of cultural thing happening. But when I look at Elsevier and I talk to people, I think the the message that is clear to me is the faster you get a a uh, peer-reviewed publication integrated into bioinformatics resources that the faster that paper will be referenced and reused and that is key uh, to the value added so there's beginning to be much more of a partnership on people who are evaluating these things we also have and I think this might be what um, was being referred to as well um, feedback between Elsevier and MGI in terms of on Elsevier pages now they link right directly back to certain subsets of data that we've curated in MGI. So they can link back to the Go annotations for that publication, they can link back to other sets of information. Um, so it, uh, I think bioinformatics, um, that the publishing is part of the bioinformatics universe and um, increasingly understanding, there's a better understanding of that, so. So you raised a, a, a couple of questions. Um, so one I think was about um, the issue of blind data. And uh, so we do have blind data for, for these shared tasks. So um, typically either what we'll do is work with, um, leave out some set of papers that as Judy said, um, have not been curated yet or they'll curate them and hold back the information or in the case of the craft corpus that I talked about when we re released it publicly on SourceForge we released 70% of it and we kept aside um, two sets of 15% of the data uh, that we don't release for use in shared tasks that um, after the, they're used only after they're used in the shared tasks will, will we relieve so there's um, you know certainly the notion of blind data and these evaluations and then um, to respond to your other question, um, in evaluating NLP tools, we're really, we're really good at doing bad shared evaluations. 
in a sense. So what I mean by that is that we have spent decades, and people like Donna Harmon and Ellen Voorhees and Lynette Hirschman have spent their entire careers working on the question of how should you evaluate an NLP system. So we understand how to design an experiment and what kind of metrics to use pretty well. What we're bad at is really making them shared tasks where people come together, try different approaches, and share what they know and learn from each other. Um, and these things tend much more likely, uh, much more commonly, to turn into competitions where you know some machine learning person comes along, tries to beat everybody else, and then moves on to the next problem. So um, you know that's really a social aspect of the whole thing that I don't think we've quite figured out. Although we are very good at knowing how do you do the experiment that'll tell you um, you know which system is giving the better performance. We're just not good at not getting people to talk about it in terms of I'm better <laughs> than everybody else. So just, just a couple comments. Well, um, one, one comment is a practical thing that I see all of us having to deal with is the access to the, the articles, both the, getting the access from the, from the publishers and then the actual storage and mechanism of ex, you know, running the analyses on, on the, the corpus or corpi, cor, whatever the plural of corpus is, corpora is. Um, so I, I just see that duplication of effort. You know, MGI is working with various publishers trying to get access to journals, and Max has got a lot of access to journals. So if we could somehow coalesce that into a common access point, that would be awesome. But the, the flip side of that is, you know, to run a production system like at, at MGI, we'd need all the articles from all the journals that we need. And it's not, I mean, I guess it would help to get half of them, but it's not quite good enough. You know, we had to figure out a way to, to, to get everything that we need. And, and the, the flip side of the, uh, the other point I want to make, you know, you just talked about the metrics, but when I see the, the F scores and the precision and recall for just the, the triage thing, uh, triage tasks, um, and they seem to be pretty high scores, and yet they're not very good. It, it, yeah, it, it seems to me we would be good to develop a better metric, at least for the triage task, that, that is actually meaningful to the bio curators. I think that's, I'm, I'm not seeing that yet, but I don't know. So one comment there is, um, what I wanted to mention in, is that in many of the bio NLP uh, challenges, what happened is that the corpus they use, uh, for example, I have a personal experience with one corpus that has extraction of, for example, um, phosphorylation. So basically uh, the protein and the phosphorylation event. And what happens is that you see the results from that competition, everybody does great, but great. But when you see the corpus, the corpus is a very, it doesn't represent the way in which phosphorylation is described in the literature in, like, um, in a real sample. So when you try those tools, when you, I guess a lot of these systems or these groups uh, publish and they use that corpus as their um, comparison and we say, they, they say we did do great, we do, 90%, 99% or something. And it happens that all sentences are very simple. It's protein A, it's phosphorylated by something, or it's phosphorylated at. It doesn't show the complexity that is seen in the, in the literature. And that I've seen a lot. So um, I just wanted to bring that into attention to the YNLP people. I just want to follow up on that in saying the description of a mouse genetics experiment is a little more complicated. So Max, and then I have a, a comment to make. Um. I wonder why, why many of these competitions don't include um, some part of the task that you actually run on the database. You know, MGI is 170,000 documents. You can run the algorithm on 5,000 random ones and see, just focus on recall, because I think the curators care a lot about recall, more than precision, right? They want to... So I wanted to comment on this, because I think that, first of all, I'd like to bring the discussion back to this focused idea of um, changing how to build tools that are useful. 
Okay, so we're talking, we're going back to the, I'm going to, I'm going to challenge the discussion at the moment and say, we are going back to the model that, that, that exists already about how we think we should be doing this. We're talking about shared evaluations, shared evaluations on tasks that are not necessarily representative of the actual challenge that biocurators are facing in the lab. And of course, this is, this is natural because this is the paradigm we've been thinking about. The challenge here today is to try and expand that and transform it and make it, make it more pertinent to a, the, the relevant problems that we face. So um, can we, what do we need to change? It's not, it's not what's broken right now. What do we need to change? How do, we, how do we address this? And how do we address this from an implementation point of view? So Max is a great demonstration of, of someone who's just gone ahead and done it, right? He's gone and talked to all of, all of the, the publishers and got the papers, and he's now in a position where he can just kind of do stuff, right? Um, just simply by executing code over the, over the things that he's managed to acquire himself. So I'd like to kind of just hone the discussion a little bit, bring, in, bring it back, um, it sounds as if we need to talk about and think about how to, um, first of all, we need to encapsulate and describe the tasks more effectively. This is something that um, I think the, the, the studies of biocuration workflows that we did a couple of years ago are very relevant to that. We should focus on that and try and make sure that we understand what triage is all about and, and how does it relate to these other, what's beyond that, but let's start with something that's somewhat tractable. Um, and then, you know, how do we as developers and, and, and people who are trying to build systems, how do we work better together? Because, you know, it's, it's again, um, it, a lot of the, the issues that, that I think we encounter um, are unnecessary, um, unnecessarily cumbersome because it's hard to share data because of licensing issues. It's hard to share code just because it's hard to share code. Um, you know, how can we, as a community, address those issues? That's kind of like, so I'd like to play the role of devil's advocate and try and focus people's attention on that. William. So when I saw that slide come up, I just started, you know, uh, uh, jumping in my boots because there's so many things that I, having, having worked on a, um, uh, having been in an academic lab and now being in um, a tech company, I've seen, you know, and knowing a lot of people that do library technology products, I've seen a very, very clear division um, in the way that academia does software and the way India industry does software. And, you know, the reason that Mendeley was successful was not because we had the best PDF parsing technology or the best search engine or the best recall or anything like that. In fact, our PDF parsing was really not all that, that good in the beginning. Um, and it, still, we're doing a lot of our stuff in a very hacky way. but. The reason, one of the main reasons we were successful is because we had the best usability. We had, um, we had good, you know, we didn't have a sales team, but we had pretty good marketing, right? We had people that went out and talked to, to biologists and said, you know, hey, here's Mendeley, and it's not crappy like these other things you've been using. You know, we were fighting against an entrenched monopoly, so like it was a bit easy for us in that way. But we didn't, when you go into the Mendeley offices and you, you sit down and talk with those people, the discussions aren't about, you know, how do we make sure that we're getting the, the best, you know, precision or recall or other, let's call them typically academic questions, the things that we're just discussing here. It's how do we get more people to like our product? How do we get people to use it? And that's really the priority. And so if you saw more, you know, um, NSF and NIH grants, that included you know, money to hire designers and UX people and marketing staff, you know, then you might see more um, uh, software coming out of academia that looks more like the stuff that comes out of industry. But it's a huge problem, you know, because the, the aim is very different. It's not about solving an academic problem. It's about getting people to use your thing and then figuring it out. Thank you. Um, I, I, so I would also say, as I'm walking across to hand the mic over to Sassy, that I think that we have to um, look at this. We can't say, let's do it the way industry does it, because we don't have the funds. We need to find a way of doing it in an open source manner that is cost effective, that kind of it is good enough. It doesn't have to be beautiful, but is really practical. So it's like, can we, can we use command line tools that just work, like Linux and stuff like that? Can we build systems that are, are, are really highly effective, don't necessarily need to look nice, 
but are really interoperable. You know, that's the kind of thing that I think we can do. Yeah, and I guess uh, one of the things that uh, we, one of the conclusions of the interactive task when users were um, testing the systems is that even though the performance of some of the tools were not great, as long as you have some way of coming to, to help you to come up with the right answer, that is good enough. So in this uh, competition, we, in this demonstration, we simply try to um, look at the time it takes using the system. If it doesn't matter, it might have a high recall more than you would like, but if it provides a good way for you to, to say it's relevant, non-relevant, then it's fine. Um, still might save time to the curator or, or the tools to provide links to the places where they are supports or, or provide, for example, um, data from databases that may support the information for the text, mi uh, text mining tool. Um, I think that's a very important thing. The look and feel is good, it's okay, but, but I think at this point from academia you cannot, it's very difficult to get the by uh, uh, NLP people to ask them to give a full system, right, an, an interface. It has to be a bigger group, I guess, for that. So, so I just wanted to say we're, we're trying to get two communities to talk to each other. And I think that, you know, the first thing you're going to need to do to do that is to be able to frame the problems in a collaborative way. So, you know, even just framing the problems to be solved is, is, is a collaborative task. And actually, it's, 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 it's the most tractable, I think, way, way to start. And so, for, for example, you know, when we were talking about how to bring together, you know, it was stunning to me, actually, to see that, you know, statistics that are commonly used to evaluate tools in the NLP field, you know, the F statistic is not something that, is, that, that makes the tool useful for biocuration. Okay, and again, it's going to depend on the application. But I think that you know the first thing to do would be to sit down and frame. You know, as as, as Max said, you know, if if what you're really interested in, you know, for the problem of triage is you don't you really don't want to miss the trues because it's easier to throw something out quickly reviewing it than to put something back into your list, right? Exactly, and so 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 you might want to frame. You know, the the relevant statistic might be. You know, at 95%, uh, you know, at 95% recall, what's my precision, right? I mean, I'm picking 95%, but whatever it might be, okay, whatever makes the problem solvable, and 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 in that way, you're framing it in terms of a metric, and then you'd work together with NLP people to figure out how do we make it clear the problem we're trying to solve and then what methods are going to be applicable to solving this problem. And again, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's got to be the give and take at the, at the level of really trying to define the problems that are going to make the most sense to assess. Uh, and it may be more than one, but I think that the, the biggest service can be, you know, if on the bio side you can say, well, here are our priorities based on, you know, the common workflows or the things that we think are costing the most time or whatever, and, and, and really be able to focus the, co the community in that sense. But I think even defining the problem is going to be collaborative because you're going to have to put it in language where it makes sense, you know, this is the problem we need solved, but we need that, that you know, and, and, and I wouldn't even know how to frame that. Um, but, but I think that's the discussion I would suggest at least that, that goes first. Um, 
Great. So just to comment on, on what you just said, I think that the 95% recall and asking what the precision is really an interesting way of framing it because it's saying that, um, at, I mean, essentially asking what the precision is with a set rate of recall is exactly what you said earlier. It's like, how much extra time am I going to have to spend throwing stuff out? Um, and which is directly corresponds, it's an intrinsic measurement that directly corresponds to the extrinsic measurement of efficiency. And that's what we have to think about. It's like, if we think that efficiency is the important metric, how can we measure that intrinsically so we don't have to monitor um, um, bioacurators when they're actually working? So, and then Judy. Yeah, one, one quick comment about that, and then I want to follow up on your points, um, which were great. So, first of all, I, I, I think, I know that recall is important. I'm not trying to argue that it's not important, but I think it's a little bit of a red herring in terms of NLP. It's always trivial to get 100% recall by just labeling everything as in, and that's useless. To, to get NLP people to focus on uh, identifying things well, you kind of need to have a, a strong emphasis on accuracy. And I think that's one of the reasons the F measure is often a mess in terms of actually deploying something, because it, it balances them equally. You can adjust the F measure to balance precision more than recall. But anyway, that's just a, a little side comment. But I totally agree and yeah, with what you said. Right. And, and, and I would, you know, the question I have is that NLP can, can do lots of different things. And I wonder if, you know, what, we really want something that speeds up the pipeline, that makes things faster for the curators. And that could be a wide variety of things that maybe haven't been considered. It could be clustering similar documents. So when a curator makes a decision about one, the system says, here's 20 more that are extremely similar. And then the curator would look at them at the same time and, and very quickly be able to say, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it, might be, it might be high precision negative class identification. Right? So you're just saying, well, there's certain distractors that are, are never in. Maybe we could recognize them easily and just weed them out, just filter them out very quickly. Um, it could be something like classifying documents into really easy cases, um, either positive or negative, and then a whole bunch of things in the middle that are uncertain. And maybe novice curators can get all the easy cases, and more experienced um, uh, curators can get the uncertain cases. Or I don't know, just think outside the box in terms of what would really speed things up and then send it back to us to figure out how to help? Um, sorry, Judy, next, and then I'll dash back with the microphone. Well, I think that brought up a couple of interesting things because it reminds me very much of work that Paul's doing in terms of looking at protein families and doing curation of protein families. And if you could serve up, at the same time, we're trying to get all the experimental data for sets of for different sets, I'll just say it that way, for different sets together. And that certainly happens in the curation pipeline where we have sets of papers waiting to be curated um, in for the same gene. Um, I want to, and I, so I like the idea of let's think beyond, what are we trying to do here? And what, and that means thinking beyond the biocuration community as well, because what we're trying to do is facilitate knowledge discovery, and that's sort of a funky term out there, but it was trying to facilitate the work of, of, of understanding human biology and disease. And from my perspective and from um, Dong Wei's perspective with plants, there's another whole agricultural field. We're trying to push forward science by, take, by, by being able to aggregate the suite of experimental information that is being funded by um, big national resources and international resources so that we can address problems of disease and food availability and environmental challenges. So in that sense, when I look at the way science happens, and this goes back to um, some other comments, where re you really want to keep pushing against the envelope. We may not get it perfect. We may not get that precision and recall perfect, but does it advance us to our goals? And I was reminded that in the old days, um, MGI brought in every single bit of data on mapping data. You could reproduce the mapping data in, in, and you, all the data was there. Now we do evidence codes. It gives you a sense of the kind of data that's supporting the assertion, right? And so we're moving, for, you know, what we're trying to do is getting the data out there and how much data, uh, when, the, when the experimental bio, you know, now we have this genome sequencing and the clinical variance 
pouring out, pouring out. Everyone's going to know exactly what their variants are. And when the, the evaluations, you know, the pushing the science forward is what do we know about this set of genes? Take any set, what do we know? And that depends upon the stuff that came before. So, how, and that's where we're scrambling in the biocuration and however NLP can support this to push forward what we know and how well we know it. And this goes to the scientific reproducibility, which is a huge problem, much of which is that we can't track where that data came from. We don't know the versions. I'm not saying that it's undoable. It's not saying that things are necessarily wrong. I don't think that's necessarily the case. It's that we can't reproduce the experiment. So I'm not going to go into that whole thing because that's a separate part. But in terms of biocuration and NLP and the bigger picture is how do we, how do we create the environment to make the hard work that's gone into experimental systems available in the aggregate and data sets in, uh, to the scientific enterprise. Way to go big, absolutely. Um, I think, so to comment on that question, I think, yeah, the big picture. So, the, but the problem with, so, so I think that, I think that this is incredibly important that we have to have that in our minds. But, but the trouble is as well, if you try and eat the whole elephant, it's just like too much. The best way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time, right? So, so if we, yeah, um, but the point that I'm trying to make is that, that I think that if we're able to solve some of the, the key stumbling blocks that we face now within biocuration, um, then other aspects of this kind of large scale vision would become more, po more possible. I mean, one of the things that, that I think is very relevant, for example, we have experts in the room here who are working in information integration, not doing text mining at all at the moment, but a lot of the work that they do would be incredibly relevant to this kind of stuff. Now, if we had a framework within which code sharing and, um, and, and open source software from computer science, from the, com the field of computer science, is able to be used easily and straightforwardly within the bio-curation and bio the bioinformatics community, then we'd be able to bring the two things together. And so I think that, that you know, by, by serving the NLP biocuration question, we would be able to serve other bigger picture, other big pic picture questions as well. So for example, um, Yolanda Gill was here earlier. She's an expert in workflows. Workflows would help us facilitate the process of going around this loop more quickly. It would also help um, us building um, uh, uh, workflows of NLP products as well, of which UEMA is one example, but there are other types of workflows as well. How do we leverage them all together? Um, Host Luis, who's sitting here, is uh, an expert in information integration. Um, how, do we, how do we get all of the different pathway databases to talk to each other, such as Reactome and Biopacks and all these other things? Now, that's a big, that's a big research question, and part of the, and, and again, it's like part of the challenge that we face there is exactly analogous to the, the, the challenge that we face within NLP, you know, how do you engage the computer scientists and get them to be able to work with biomedical data that it's kind of a little bit difficult for them because it's not something they're experts in. So I would, I would, I acknowledge, I think, Judy, that the, the question that you're, you're raising is incredibly important. And I'm suggesting that maybe we could make that, that, you know, it, by focusing on the biocuration problem in the way we're framing it, we actually can address these other things as well quite effectively. Has Luis? Thank you. Since you mentioned the information integration, so, I mean, I know most of the work I've been focused on NLP and text mining techniques and so on, but I mean, do you have also a problem of getting data from multiple sources to help you in the bio, in the bio curation process? Or do you need to get access to, I you know, DBGAP or DBSNP or, or all the different NCBI databases and other things? Well, access in a, in a way that would help you but more than the way you access them today. Because I mean, we have some techniques, some technology to help you map all these sources to a common schema, help you query them in an integrated way. If you consult different databases to make your assessment of curation, then that's something we can help. I mean, I didn't want to derail this because I've been focused on text mining, but if there are other, other fields that are useful to this, this task, then I think there will be people that will be happy to, to work on that, like me. <laughs> Thanks. So any other questions, Cecilia? Comments, thoughts. So, 
in part, BioCreative is supposed to provide that uh, framework in which there is a connection between the biocreation community and the text mining community, BioNP community. Uh, what I would like to know is how to improve that because it looks like it needs uh, some work. Uh, although we've been working very closely to, with various biocreation uh, groups and we've been trying to recruit biocreators and make them um, part of this uh, effort. Um, so I would like to see, to, to see from the people who already participated or is participating what we can do uh, to fulfill this. Uh, the idea uh, this time is we're trying to come up uh, all the corpus that is generated via this effort to make it accessible, at least from the interactive task uh, for with a BIOC format, which is a new f uh, format for annotations. And the idea is um, that it's interoperable. So you can take the output from one tool and use it as an input input in another tool. Um, if it's compatible with this format. So that will facilitate. So we are uh, now uh, working a little bit on the interoperability. Maybe Kevin can say a little bit more. Uh, but to tell you the truth, I don't know what else to do because <laughs> I've been very closely trying to get via curators and by NLP people together. And so far the idea is, okay, let's see what is out there and how by curators, yeah, okay how by your creators think of it and see how they can come together and do something. But maybe the point is the other way around. By your creators have to, and we, that's why we were doing the workflow uh, experiment, is to see what are the roadblocks and try to see, okay, now we need to tackle these problems because this is a common problem across the by your creation uh, databases. Uh, but I really don't know what else to do. <laughs> Um, I think where we're going is that we're going to move away from relational database systems and into more RDF and, and forward-looking information formats that are more exchangeable among all these systems because one of the struggles with these tools has been that each schema is different and each group has slightly different ways of handling information. So as we move forward into new ways of, of, of um, <clears throat> um, scoping our data and representing our data, the more we'll be able to exchange the data and run these and have a general um, mechanism for data exchange that facilitates the curation. So, I so uh, on the RDF side, so if you have, I mean, RDF is great and I like RDF and I publish in the Semantic Web community, but it doesn't go away from the different schemas. So you can map it to RDF, but if you're using the name for your classes and your relationships, are still different, you still have this problem of, of mapping among them. But we do have technique, I mean, that's what I do more or less for a living, of helping to do these schema mappings and these translations. And we have tools, actually interactive tools, you don't have to be a computer scientist to use, to help you map something in a relational database or in a, in a schema into a, a schema that you like. So if there's a BIOC a schema that you like some data in, and we can map, and you have different tools that have different formats, we can map into that. But I mean, that, if somebody's interested with that, can, we can talk offline in, in the dinner. So to back up a couple of steps on just the whole issue of how do you get interactions to work well between curators and NLP people, I th you actually improve with practice. I mean, I, I really see the situation getting better. So in the first BioCreative, um, we had a task that required interaction between BioCurators and NLP people, and it was moderately disastrous. Um, the BioCurators walked away irritated, and the NLP people walked away with their feelings hurt. And, um, you know, by now, by BioCreative 4, we have um, much more harmonious relations, and um, people seem to, I think the bio curators understand better how to make known to us what, what they're looking for, and uh, we understand better how to um, give that to them. And um, I mean, I, I see the situation getting better. I don't think it's perfect by any means, but I see a lot of improvement. Yeah, I should make it very clear that I'm in no way criticizing the bio creative effort. I think you guys are awesome. Um, yeah, but absolutely, and, and I think that, that um, I'm, I'm really excited because I think strategically, I've, so I've got, a, I've got an idea, I'd like to share it with you guys and feel free to kind of criticize or, or suggest other alternative ways of doing things. So first of all, I think we need to focus on the task, the curation tasks that we're addressing. 
within the context of, a data, of, of databases, but we have to actually focus on a specific task that has some utility. Um, then we have to think outside the box from the point of view of, we, we, we have to give up trying to be computer scientists, okay? We have to stop trying to be computer scientists. We have to say, okay, given the fact that we want to speed up the process, can we effectively describe what the blocks are and what we think, we don't, don't necessarily know how these, these processes will be, this, these problems will be solved, but let's try and understand what the problems are. Then we go to the NLP people who are really experts at this kind of stuff and we say, listen, we think that you know, clustering could be a good idea or this idea of getting rid of negative examples could be a good idea. But, or alternatively, we really no need to know the precise gene names of every single thing that we're looking at. I mean, can we, can we just, instead of acting as the software developers and the, and the computer scientists, we should act as the end users and, and we should describe what our research problems are in a very clear way. That's gonna help us, that's gonna help us as well without trying to presuppose without trying to bring our knowledge of, computer, of, of what we think the NLP solution should be, we need to kind of be able to try and describe that as accurately as possible. Then once we've done that, then we talk to the NLP people, then we talk to the, the people who can scale up to mass, we, we let them be creative about it, we let them solve the problem, and then once they've come up with good solutions and, 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 and algorithms that, and data structures and things that they think that, that are really practically useful, then we come back and we take those solutions, we implement them in standard frameworks and in stand standardized tools where we can then deploy those tools to the databases and actually have them work. So that's a general strategy and I'm, it's a little, you know, I, I realize that I'm, I'm kind of presenting this in a, in my characteristically somewhat brusque way, so forgive me if this is a bit ruffling of feathers, but that's what I think would be a good idea. So, um I remember some years ago at one of the biocreative, Lynette Hirschman, saying how all this work had been done and we had yet to see a tangible change in the work of the bioinformaticians and the people doing on the model organism databases and uh, lamenting that fact. And I want to thank Gully for um, his work in bringing, in bringing this to this new zone. And I think this has been a very successful meeting. So first off, I'd just like to thank Gully for this meeting. And then I forget what I was going to say. It's so <laughs> seldom that I say things. <laughs> so I'll remember. That's incredibly sweet. Thank you, Judy. Um, OK, so um, let's, what do you guys think? You know, if that's a, if, is that a viable strategy? Would that be something that we would be able to get behind? Um, am I wrong? What do you think? And any of the NLP people, feel free to kind of chirp up at this point. Ulf, perhaps? No? My other point is that um, uh, threaded through here every so often was the idea that we could automate this process. And I want to reiterate where I think most of us are, which is that we can partially automate some of it. And yet, and just as we're bringing two communities together, we're also bringing together the ability to, to make use of, of algorithms to do a lot of the work and then also make use of the uh, expertise of the domain experts to finish it off. And so I, I continually like to think of this as a semi-automated process. And um, I'm, I'm sure almost everyone in the room is there, but sometimes the, the language gets to where it's all gonna be done in an automated fashion. And in fact, I do think it takes both components, just as a, this is an exercise in bringing several communities together. There's also that aspect of bringing the, the domain experts together with the ability to um, make use of and, and benefit from the engineering that can go on with this kind of information. So this might be a totally crazy idea, and feel free to shoot it down. I just wanted to throw it out there. Um, key in all this gully, I think, would be having some sort of evaluation framework to, to validate that what we're doing actually would speed up the pipeline. And I wonder if it would be possible, this is the weird part, to create like a, um, a bio curator simulator 
<laughs> where we could, like, what if we had a perfect system to do what you're, you're thinking would re really be helpful? <laughs> well, no, 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 I don't mean to replicate it. I mean something that would, um, like, assume, assuming the NLP system did, did things perfectly, right? And then could we validate with human curators how much it would help and then find some way to create an evaluator that's sort of the simulator that, that roughly approximates um, the, the identification of speed up. So, so let me give you an example. Um, so suppose we say that clustering similar documents together would speed up the curation process because as soon as a curator says yes to one, if we found other documents that were clearly very similar, it would be half the cost to, to uh, curate those as it would have been otherwise, right? You could, you could set that up in a simulation framework that, that you know, quantifies the cost benefit of performing good NLP in that way. Does that make sense? And then you could validate that against real humans to see did it really speed things up half as much, or I don't know, something along those lines where So when you say a simulator, it's, it's like, um, uh, a, so in a way what you're saying is build a theory of evaluation for this where we can, um, a model if you like, of the process of, of curation so that the metrics that we're looking at would be some measurement of effort that a curator would expand in a given day. And then, okay, if we were able to, let's say that that effort was halved by the process of being able to find similar documents. I mean, in, th in fact, you're, having, you're, you're saying, can we build a theory of um, bio-curation, basically? For the, for, the one task. For, the, for, the, for the specific task. So given a task, can we conceptualize and, and theorize about what it is we expect to find, and then see if we can simulate that and understand how that works? I think that sounds like a very interesting challenge. I would think you could also test that hypothesis by actually getting, um, instead of having a program do the clustering, you could have a human do the clustering beforehand and then see if it actually helps the bio-curator down the line. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Stop, hold on, wait, stop, 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 stop talking. Because no one can hear you if, if on, online if you don't speak into the microphone. So for the interactive task, we measure not only the performance of the tool, but the time it takes curators to do the task manually or using the tool, right? Manually means, as you said, give them the set of documents and they classify or cluster by similarity. Um, and we measure uh, the time it takes to do that. And also we measure whether the tool helps to, maybe might help to get a better precision, a better uh, performance at doing the accuracy of doing the, the job. I was just suggesting that apart from having the tool measure, uh, apart from measuring whether the tool helps um, the bio curator, also measure whether having a pre-clustered set um, with what the tool's ideal response would be, would that help the bio curator? So even if the tool was perfect, would it actually speed things up? Okay, so, um, sure. I'm not quite sure how this fits in, but this idea of creating data sets, I know that when we do on working on specific areas of the ontology, one of the um, places to start is with recent reviews of a pathway, for example, and you get an expert's idea of what the most highly relevant papers are for that field, and so you now you have a, 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 a vetted set um, that uh, initiates the task. and. So there are those that, that expert sets are available in various ways. Great, so um, we're a little over, and I wanted to, so I'm you know, consistent with, with the way in which we've organized, and this is a great discussion, it's a very big shame to kind of cut it off, but you, you guys have suffered enough, you've done a great work today, thank you, all, thank you everybody for your contribution. I'd like to everybody give each other a round of applause, that's wonderful work. So, um, you look confused, are you okay?
Ah, what's next? Good question. So we have from 5.30 till we've, we've had a full day's work. So um, we, we now have a break from now until 7. Um, so you've got an hour and a half to relax, to kind of, re to, to kind of take in the sights, have a drink. If you want to go back to your room, have a shower, that kind of thing. Um, then we can come back here at 7. Um, where we will have dinner ready, and we will ha you have a you should have a meal ticket and a drink ticket, so make sure that you 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 have one of these. Oh dear, um, and but well, we can't feed you if you don't have one of those. But but we'll f we'll figure something out. <laughs> so and the idea is that um, we'll just meet here. We'll have a little discussion. Um, I'll try and summarize the day and and kind of come back with some, uh, maybe a, a little bit of a presentation just to kind of summarize what it is we've done. Um, and we'll have dinner and that will be that. So um, the rest of the evening is, is informal and should be just fun. Um, and I just wanted to thank everybody for spending the time to, to come all this way, to participate in this meeting and, um, and to make comments and do all this kind of stuff. So. Oh, in terms of work. Ah, so rather than what, what are we going to eat for dinner, you actually want to know, you want to know what the science is. Um, so how to follow up. First of all, um, we have a recording of the entire day's events, um, which we have, we've, we've streamed today to the, oh, and uh, I should also just, I'd like to say thank you to the, the audiovisual team for their great work. You've done terrific work um, supporting us. Thank you again. Um, and... So, so we have we will have a video of the entire day's events that we'll put up on YouTube. Um, I'm and I, I I'm going to have to sit down and think about what it is has happened and try and summarize it in some way. Um, if it's possible, I would love to try and write this up as a as a workshop description, um, perhaps to the database journal. I, I've been in contact with Mike Cherry, who uh, is an editor of that journal, and um, so there may be some opportunities to, to write up what we've, we've, what we've been talking about here as a perspective or something, I don't know. Um, but following up, I think um, I would encourage you to swap contact details with people who you'd like to collaborate and, and specifically pursue um, individual projects as necessary. And I'd, I'd really love, to, I'd personally love to hear from all of you about your ideas about follow-up issues so you should email me. Um, my email address is gully at usc.edu. I think it's in the handout um, brochure, so you should be able to find me quite easily. Um, and uh, let me know what you think. And um, I, I'll, I will come up, I will actually uh, present something at the dinner to try and make some concrete suggestions as well as to what it is I think would be the good, some good next steps. But thank you for your, your question. I'm sorry, I, I missed the point then. Okay, good, thanks. Uh, okay, so see you at seven.